how do you get to heaven? And as I posted on uh, the Facebook page yesterday, why do good people go to hell? And that kind of flies in the face of a lot of what we'd like to think about. You know, we, we, we hear this often, you hear this in popular culture and that kind of thing. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Um, but we're going to look at what Jesus says about that and what Jesus says about why people that we would consider good, because we know in the scriptures it says really there's no one good, but why would people that we consider good go to hell? And of course we know it's because they don't know Jesus. But first, um, I, I'm excited. I just want to uh, take just a second to say I'm excited to see what God is doing here at Bridge 42. God is truly at work, and it's really encouraging me, to me to see people stepping up and taking responsibility for the things we're doing. We've got people stepping up and taking care of the nursery. Uh, new people that, that haven't ever been involved in the children's ministry are, being in, are involved in the children's ministry. Communion is being taken care of every week. And, and we had several volunteers who worked really hard, and I think we should give them one more uh, round of applause this morning, worked really hard this week to put on a great VBS on kind of short notice, and they did a fantastic job. And I love it because this is what church is all about. It's not something we go to. It's something we are. It's something, it's, it's who we are. We're the people of God working together, doing life together and serving together, being a blessing to the world around us. And, and, and God is doing that. He's beginning that work here. Not beginning, but He's continuing that work here in our midst. And He is just bringing us in, putting us together. And, and, and I believe He's going to really use us to impact this community for His gospel and for His name. And so I want to encourage you with that this morning and, and that I love what I'm seeing and I love that people are stepping up. But I also want to challenge you to continue to do that, to continue to come together. And, and, and there's two things really that you can do um, to continue that work. You know, the first is, is to give. We are responsible for running this church. It's on us. We, are, um, we have this incredible opportunity to bless the community around us. And there's a lot of need around us and there's need in this room. So I'm just encouraging those of you that God has blessed to share what God has blessed you with. You know, I've talked about before that uh, a lot of us kind of run through life with a, with a closed fist, a white-knuckled grip on, on the things that we have. And, and, and God, I think, would call us to, to kind of loosen that grip, to, to, to hold on loosely, in the words of an 80s band, to hold on loosely to the, the possessions and the things that we have and the things of this world. To, to walk instead with a closed fist, to walk instead with, a, with an open hand. And so I want to encourage you to do that so that we can be more of a blessing to the people around us. And the other is to serve. There's lots of needs around here. There's all kinds of things that need to be done, and, and we need people to serve. And so we've got the, uh, again, have the contact information for the elders up here. And if, uh, if you are feeling like God is leading you to serve in some capacity, but you're not sure where, you're, not, you're like, okay, I'm ready, but what do I do? Where do I get plugged in? Then give us a call. Send us an email. We will, we will find you a place where you can serve and where you can join in. Because that's one of the greatest joys and blessings that we can have as a Christian is to join in with, with the work that God is doing around us. And so I want to encourage you to do that as well. And one more really thing really quickly. And elders, I'm kind of going to out you a little bit here. So, so uh, here we go. We've split up the names of, of everyone that, that all, everybody that we have contact information for that regularly comes to Bridge 42 that, that consider that we consider you know part of our church family, and um, and we're going to be calling and we've already started. Many of you are, have already started calling, emailing, just getting in touch with people, just letting you know that that we love you, that uh, and that we're available. That that you know we're without a lead pastor right now, but we're available. If you have a need, if you have a a, a need that you know you need somebody to to talk with you, to counsel with you, you need somebody to pray with you, or just somebody to to, to whine to about stuff. We are here for that. That's what we consider it a privilege to be able to, to provide that kind of, of care for you. So we're going to be contacting you. So if you don't get contacted, that means one of these guys is not doing their job, right? So, so just call me or, or, or email me or call one of the elders or whatever. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find whose heads we need to knock together. No, but I just want to let you know that we're doing that, that we're committed. We as, we as leaders are, are committed to you as a church body. And... Um, we're just, we're honestly, we are, we are thankful for that privilege to be able that, that God would, would put us in that position. So um, I just want to encourage you with that this morning and, um, and just ask you to, to keep doing what you're doing. It is, a, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to be um, 
involved in what God is doing here at Bridge 42. So, as we move on in the God's Not Dead series, today we tackle a very difficult question. Why do good people go to hell? And why do, and of course, like I said before, we know that really according to the Bible, there's nobody good. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. But why do what we consider good people go to hell? And why do sometimes what we consider bad people, it kind of seems unfair. You know, a guy lives a pretty good life and, and, and does, you know, pretty good things and, and doesn't know Jesus. And then the other guy kind of, you know, doesn't live a very good life, but he comes to know Jesus at the end of his life. kind of seems unfair in our humanness. And it's because we have this kind of this faulty mindset or this, this mindset that's different than God's mindset. And I want to explore that this morning. And I want to explore that. I think the best passage to do that is, is the story of the rich young ruler. Most of y'all are probably familiar with that story. It's found in two places in the Gospels. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's found in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to kind of bounce back and forth between the two, but we're going to focus a little bit more on, on Luke's uh, telling of the story. And it's the same, I mean, it's the same story, it's the same events, uh, but each one, each writer, kind of words things a little bit differently, and, and we can get some different insight into that event as we look at both accounts. But we're going to read out of Luke's Gospel first, and kind of camp out there a little bit, and, and you know, kind of bounce back into Matthew's uh, from time to time. So if you have your Bibles, I'm sorry, but I'm fighting a cold this morning, so I'm trying to be able to make it, you know, 50, 60 minutes. Like, I mean, just kidding. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 26. Y'all brought a snack with you this morning, right? <laughs> Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 26, it says, A ruler asked him, this takes place, Jesus is traveling from Galilee. He's kind of finished up with his Galilean ministry. He's traveling to Jerusalem. It's kind of a, a slow process. He's going and, and preaching in different towns and doing miracles in different towns as he goes. But this is the part of the gospel where it's beginning to slowly build toward the climax of where Jesus would go to the cross. And, and, and this, this young ruler, um, he meets up with this young ruler somewhere on the road in between Galilee and Jerusalem. And this a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, Matthew actually includes love your neighbor as yourself. Luke, for some reason, doesn't include that. Um, and he said, all these things I have kept, uh, the, the ruler, the rich young ruler said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So we're going to look at Jesus in this, in this passage. He makes four statements that are going to reveal three things. They're going to reveal the mindset of this young man that's approached Jesus. They're going to reveal the heart condition of this young man that's approached Jesus. And they're going to reveal the heart of God towards him and towards all of us. <clears throat> And, and this is, it's not, like, it's not like one statement reveals one and another statement reveals another. It's, it's kind of all like a package deal. It's, it's, it's as if you have a sculptor and he has this big block of stone and he begins to chisel away at this big block of stone. And this is what Jesus is doing. This man's heart is, uh, is he's built up walls. Um, he's built up, you know, he's got all these kind of pretenses and these false beliefs and these walls that he's built up between him and God. And Jesus, with these questions and with these words, is chiseling away at all of these false beliefs and at all of these pretenses and all of these walls that he's built between him and God. And he's, and until we reveal, you know, it's like the sculptor, he chisels away at that block of granite until we see a beautiful sculpture. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's chiseling away at this hard, stony heart until we see the condition of it. We have a clear picture of, of who he is and of who God is. And so the first thing Jesus says, he says, why do you call me good? The man, the man comes to him and says, 
good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the first thing Jesus says to him is, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And, and I, th- th- this one, I remember when I was a teenager, most of y'all know that I didn't grow up in church. The first time I heard the gospel, I was 13 years old. That was the first time I ever heard, the, heard a clear presentation of the gospel. And over the next year, I kind of struggled with it, and I started going to church, and then I, I began to, to believe, and I, I came to Christ. And uh, over that time, I, 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 after about a year, I got baptized, and, and somebody gave me a Bible, so I started to read it. And I actually started out, I was like, well, you know, it's like, uh, I, I guess, you know, it started at the beginning. So I started out with Genesis, and then somebody told me that I should start out with the Gospels. And so I remember... You know, very clearly, one of the things I remember is as a teenager, 14, 15, 16 years old, I'm reading for the first time stories and, and passages in the Bible that many of you all have, have had drilled into your head from the time you were three and four and five and six years old. And so I'm coming to them as a 15-year-old with kind of a different perspective than maybe some of you have, have uh, had in your experience. And I remember one of the things that stood out to me about this passage as a teenager reading it for the first time was... Uh, it seems kind of rude. You know, he comes up to him, hey, you know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? It's like, dude, he's just, you know, he's trying to give you a compliment. I mean, he's just trying to be nice. He's just calling you good teacher. You know, it's, I, I know you got this, like, angry young prophet thing going on. I know you're, you're trying to, you know, you've got this, like, anti-authoritarian, you know, the, the religious leaders have it all wrong, and I've come from God. To, I know you've got this angry young prophet thing going on, but he's just trying to be nice. It's not like he's making a theological statement, right? Except he kind of is. When he, when he comes up to somebody and he calls them good, he is making a theological statement about, you know, a statement of, of, of fact or what he believes to be fact. And Jesus, like I said, he's chiseling away at these, these false beliefs and at these pretenses and these walls and these fronts that this man has put up. And he's trying to get to the heart of the matter. And what Jesus understands is that, yes, he was right when he acknowledges Jesus as good, but he was right for the wrong reasons. You know the old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. The three lefts do, you know. No, two wrongs don't make a right. But in this case, they kind of do because this man kind of accidentally got to the right conclusion. Jesus is good, but he had two faulty lines of reasoning that led him to this conclusion. What he didn't understand and what Jesus is trying to get at is that Jesus is not the authority on what is good because he does good things, because he heals the sick, because he causes the blind to see, and he teaches the truth and all of that. He is not good for those reasons. He is good because he is God. And all that other stuff is just a natural outflow of his innate goodness. Does it make sense? In your notes, Jesus did not become good because he did good things. He does good things because he is naturally, innately good. And that's what this man didn't understand. And in the same way, you and I do not become sinners. This is also in your notes. You and I do not become sinners because we have committed sin. We commit sin because we are innately sinners. That's who, after the fall, that's who we have become. Sin has kind of like infected our whole being. Jesus said, out of the overflow of our heart comes all of our, all of our, I'm, I'm just, I can't remember the verse exactly, but out of the, the overflow of our heart comes all of our, out of our evil desires comes the things that we say. And the, we are not sinners because we have sinned. We sin because we are sinners. And this is important because it kind of flies in the face of a lot of what is taught in our culture today and even what is taught in our churches today. You and I are not good. We are not good. We are sinners. That's who we are apart from Christ. And we are not sinners because we have sinned. We sin because we are apart from Christ at our core sinners. So, so that's what Jesus is doing. He's chiseling away and he's beginning to reveal this man's mindset in his heart. And all of a sudden, in this seemingly insignificant phrase, Jesus has revealed two deeply held theological beliefs that this man has had for his whole life that are completely incompatible with each other. On one hand, this man claims to believe in the Scriptures. He's asking, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We'll see in a minute. He says that he's kept the law, so he has this belief in the law and has this basic understanding in the law, or at least the Ten Commandments. And so he has this belief that the, the scriptures are true, but on this other hand, he has this, this belief in his, like, in his basic goodness. He has this belief that he can 
be good, that people, people can be good, in his capacity to be good. One of these has to be false, because they don't go together. The Bible that he claims to believe says things like, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It says that no one seeks God. It says that no one does good. The Bible says that we have become altogether worthless, that we are dead in our transgressions and sins. At one point it calls us objects of wrath, and yet he has these two beliefs, and he's kept them separated for his whole life. He's never once examined them in the light of each other. And then for the first time ever, with six little Jesus words, with six little words, Jesus takes these two beliefs and he lifts them up, he pulls them out of the depths of his soul, and he smashes them together. And, they, and he comes to this point where he realizes, or at least he should realize, they can't both be true. The Bible cannot be true and humanity be basically good apart from God. So what's it going to be? And, and many of y'all have been in this situation. Many of y'all have, have, have had this experience where something you've really believed or something you've really trusted in or something you've really, that's been really important to you, that, that God has, has done this where he's kind of just pulled it out and you've come to this realization that this can't be true or this can't be right or this can't be the way things are. You know, I've had this experience where, you know, how can I profess this on one hand and, and do these things on the other? And, and we've all kind of been this situ in this situation where, where God is working in our lives and, and everything we've ever thought we've known or everything we've ever done just kind of comes crumbling down. And if you're there this morning, if that's you where it seems like God is just, you know, dragging things out of you and, and, and tearing one stone down off of the other. It's not easy, but be encouraged because that means that God's Holy Spirit is working in your life. And that is something to be encouraged and to be joyful about. It's not easy, but God is at work. And that's something to be encouraged about. So the second thing Jesus says, the second statement he makes, is keep the commandments. And the man says, let's go back and read it actually. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these I have kept from my youth. Really? All of them? I'm not going to say too much about this here because most of you know what we teach here at Bridge 42 and how we approach the scriptures. Um, but I do want to say this for, for those of you that might be newer here. You know, the commandment says, do not lie. It says, do not bear false witness. It doesn't say like, hey, you know, man, you know, keep it to no more than two or three a week. Or, you know, make sure there are little lies. You know, it's, it says, do not lie. The commandment says, do not steal. It doesn't put a dollar value on it. It doesn't say like, hey, as long as it's worth less than $10, you're okay. And it's probably not, you know, I'm sure you didn't mean to do it anyways. It says, do not steal. And in fact, if you look at the Tenth Commandment, see, even if you could keep the first nine commandments, if you look at the Tenth Commandment, the Tenth Commandment says, do not covet or do not desire these things. Basically, it's saying, do not even think about it. So even if you can say, well, hey, I've got the don't commit adultery, I've got the don't commit murder, do not steal, do not lie, the Tenth one is don't even think about it. And I don't think any of us can stand up to that one. And, and one thing Jesus says too, I, I love how Jesus includes, in Matthew's version of this story, he includes, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's not one of the Ten Commandments. It's in, it's in Leviticus, it's actually in Leviticus uh, chapter 24. <clears throat> but this does two things. First off, it broadens the term commandments. So he's not just referencing the Ten Commandments, he's referencing the whole law. And so for this rich young man to, to say, well, all these I've kept from my youth, is almost like silly now because in the whole law there's over 600 commandments and he probably doesn't even know them all, much less has he kept them all. Even if he has kept them all, he wouldn't, he wouldn't know it because he doesn't know them all. And the, so it broadens that view of the commandments. And the second and more important is that Jesus is about to use this command in particular, to love your neighbor as yourself. He's about to use this command in particular to reveal the state of this man's heart. Before we get to that, we can see that Jesus has already chiseled away at that stone block, and he's clearly revealed the state of this man's mind. And the state of this man's mind, in your notes, is moralism. He is looking, and even from his very first question, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? His state of mind is moralism. He is looking for something that he can do 
to earn heaven. And in your notes, moralism is placing moral principles above spiritual truth. And it was a problem in Jesus' day. It was a problem in the Old Testament times. It's been a problem throughout church history. And it's still a problem today. Our default setting as human beings clouded by the cancer of sin, our default setting is moralism. We say things like, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Or, or you know, you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Be your own man. Make your own way. God helps those who help themselves, which if anybody's wondering, is not in the Bible. Um, our default setting is, is moralism. And there's nothing wrong with morality. In fact, morality is good. God calls us to be good. And, but, but moralism says do it yourself. Make your own way. Be moral. Be better. Do better. And, and God's, God, in the gospel, He gives us the, the power to do those things. And it's only through Him that we can become good and can become moral. And that's what the difference is. And so that's what this man's default mindset is. And that's what in, in, in our culture today, many people's default mindset is. And even being taught in many churches is more this form of kind of moralism than, of, than, the, than truly the gospel. And so maybe in this room, some of you are kind of in this moralistic type tendency. You thought, well, if I just kind of pray the prayer and I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I do do this, then I'm, then I'm good. But that's not what the gospel says. So let's look at what Jesus says. Let's look at his third statement. And we'll begin to reveal this man's heart and, and, and also our hearts apart from Christ and also uh, the heart of God towards us. <clears throat> the third statement is, uh, sell what you have and give it to the poor. Well, let's look at this in the light of his supposed belief in the Scriptures. So this man's already said he believes in the Scriptures, he believes in the law, he's keeping the law, right? Right? So, so, so he's, he's saying he believes this Bible. So let's look at this statement in the light of this belief in the Scriptures. The Old Testament is filled with statements about God's glory and God's sovereignty, and the New Testament is. But, but it says things like, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It says things like, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The Lord kills and He makes alive. I could go on and on. And so Jesus confronts this man with this truth again. He's saying, okay, you're telling me you believe in the Scriptures. You're telling me you believe in the Bible and that you believe in this stuff. So this isn't going to be hard. Just take all you have, because it's not yours anyways if you really believe in the Bible. Just take all you have, sell it, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And this shouldn't be that hard because it's not yours anyways, right? It's God's. He owns it all. It's all His. He gives. He takes away. He kills. He makes alive. So just give it all up. Lay it all down because it's not yours anyways. And of course, again, this man's at a crisis. Because, yeah, he claims to believe in the Scriptures, but that doesn't line up at all with what he believes or what he wants for his life. <clears throat> and so with this third statement, Jesus has chiseled away at all the layers, all the pretense, all of the fronts that he's put up, and he's revealed the state of his heart. And the state of his heart is that he is far from God. He's lived a pretty moral life. He's probably a pretty decent guy. He's the kind of guy you'd like to hang out with. But his heart is far from God. And I wonder if in our churches today there's some people like that. Yeah, yeah, we go to church on Sunday and we, we throw $20 in the offering basket and we, we try to live a decent life. We don't drink too much. We don't cuss. At least not when anybody's around. But our hearts are far from God. We're trusting in our own good works and our own morality and we're not trusting in the cross. And so this man has come face to face with it. And in this story, this man goes away. He doesn't want to deal with it. He doesn't want to face who he is in the light of God's glory. But there are some other people that kind of hang around and they begin to ask Jesus questions. And if we go back to the text in verse, uh, verse 24, it says, Jesus, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I don't think that happens too often, just, just saying. <laughs> Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Because if it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a, rich, for, for a person to enter, a, a rich person or a person who thinks they're rich or a person who thinks they have it all together. That's where the second question on Facebook comes in with what, what do you do when having everything is still not enough? If it's easier for, for, for a camel to go through an eye of a, the eye of a needle 
than for somebody who thinks that they've got everything and they've got it all together to see the kingdom of God. Who then can be saved? And Jesus answers with this fourth statement. He says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It reveals God's heart towards us, and that is grace. Our default setting, apart from Christ, apart from the gospel, is, is moralism. It's good works. It's, it's earning our own way. But God's default setting towards us, because he understands who we are apart from him, God's default setting towards us is grace. And that's hard for people, even people who have... Uh, who have been in church their whole lives, it's hard for people to really wrap their minds around grace. And I've talked to several people over the years that they just, they've come to this understanding, I've been going to church all my life, you know, I've, I've prayed the prayer, but I've never really understood, I've never really come to grips with the fact that salvation is not anything that I could do or anything that I could earn or anything I can pray the sinner's prayer enough times to get or, or, or come down to the altar enough times or get baptized enough times to get. But that's not, I, and I've talked with people so many times and they've come to this realization that it's God's work. It's God initiated that God sent Jesus to us. He didn't say come to him. He sent Jesus to us and he comes to us and he works in our hearts and he works in our minds and works in our lives and gets us to the place where we're finally able to accept grace and to understand who we are in, in, in comparison with God's glory and to accept that grace. But it's, it's hard because it goes against a lot of what we see in our culture, even in our church culture today. And so I want to really quick, in the next maybe five minutes, just go over three objections to grace that we hear in kind of church culture. The first one is like is the word of faith or word of faith movement of the prosperity gospel. And basically what that says is, is we believe in grace, but but like your standing with God is dependent on the strength of your faith. You hear things like um, I've heard prosperity teachers say things like uh, um, your your um, how high you go in life is directly related to, to your obedience and to the strength of your faith. And, and we don't really see that in the Bible. God does, obviously faith is very important, but, but, but in the Bible it's not the strength of your faith. It's not how much faith you have compared to the other people around you. It's the strength of the God whom you've placed your faith in. And so that's very comforting this morning. That's very, I think that that's just freeing this morning because it doesn't matter if you are just a person of great faith or if you're a person who just struggles every day to, to get out of bed and, and to believe. Because it's not about the strength of your faith, it's about the strength of your God. And if you have a weak faith, but that weak faith has been put in, in, into a strong God, that's, that's what grace is about. And, and we see in the prosperity gospel things like, just honestly horrible things like, you know, if somebody dies... It, it, it's because they didn't have enough faith, or somebody, you know, somebody who, who, uh, you know, they they come to financial ruin. It's well, they, their faith wasn't strong enough, and it's lies. We've replaced the moralism of previous generations. You know, don't drink, don't cuss, don't hang around people that do. We've replaced this with like this positive, encouraging message of health, wealth, and prosperity, but it's still based on us. It's still based on your prosperity is related to how strong your faith is. Your health is related to how how obedient you have been. If you're sick or if you're, if you're uh, coming to financial ruin, it's because God's punishing you for something. And honestly, it's disgusting. People do not get sick and die because they don't have enough faith or because they're being punished by God. People do not get sick and die for these reasons. They get sick and die because they we live in a fallen, sinful world and because that sometimes bad stuff happens. Sometimes unimaginably bad heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, incomprehensibly terrible things happen. And it's not anybody's fault. But through it all, there is a God who loves us. And through it all, there's a God who gave himself up for us. And through it all, there's a God who gives grace. And it's not based on our obedience or based on the strength of our faith, but it's based completely in his kindness and his mercy. And that's the gospel. Second objection to grace is this idea of standards. And this was like a big catchphrase in a lot of your real conservative Baptist movements about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it may still be, I'm not sure. But it was kind of like a way of saying, well, I believe in grace, but of getting out of it. You know, well, I believe God's, in God's grace, but I also believe in standards. 
And, and yeah, I mean, God has certain standards of behavior. God has a law that he calls his people to keep. But again, our standing with God is not based on keeping those standards. Our standing with God is based on what Christ has done. Rich Mullins, who is one of my favorite worship singers, uh, he actually died in the late 90s, but he, he wrote many of the great worship songs of the 80s and 90s that many of y'all would know. He used to tell a story he, he would tell about when he was a teenager. He was kind of one of those teenagers that that was kind of, you know, he said, I was, I was kind of sad, and I wore dark clothes, and I wrote poetry all the time. I was kind of like this sad, weird kid. And, and people would come up to me all the time in church, and they would say things like, smile, God loves you. And he said, I, I remember thinking, well, God loves everybody. That doesn't make me special. <laughs> it just means he ain't got no taste. And then he would say, and I don't think he does. God's love for us is not based on us, it's based on Him. The number three objection to grace, and this might be the biggest one, is, is too much teaching on grace removes the incentive for right living. And, and there's two problems with that. The first is like the whole idea of why Jesus came. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. Leonard Ravenhill was a great a uh, revival preacher in the early 20th century. And he said, Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. Jesus didn't come to make us like slightly better behaved sinners. He came, that's not Larry Ravenhill, that's me. He came, he came to justify us and to work in us and to bring us to that conclusion of our lives where we will stand before God righteous and holy, not because of us, but because of Him. Now there is some truth to this statement. Too much teaching on grace removes incentive for right living. But it's not because of grace. It's because there's a lot of teaching in the church today that does remove any motivation for good works and for right living. But it's not grace that's being taught too much. It's that grace is not really truly being taught at all. We have this thing that we call grace, but it's not true biblical grace. It's like a false grace. False grace, and you've heard this message. You, you hear this message on TV, and you hear this message in books and, and in churches. False grace tells us we're okay. Eh, it's okay. We don't have to worry if we mess up because God sees our heart. He knows that we're trying, and we can find comfort in that. In reality, though, the idea that God sees our hearts and our motivations shouldn't be comforting. It should be terrifying. On our own, our hearts are diseased. Think about those things that you say when you think that person's not looking, not listening. Think about those things that go through your mind and the things that you think when you think nobody's around. Our hearts are diseased. They're wicked on their own. And they're separated from God. We shouldn't find comfort in the idea that God sees our hearts. We should be a little bit afraid of the idea that God sees our hearts. False grace tells us our sin is no big deal. You're forgiven. God just overlooks our faults. We're okay. True grace tells us, because our sins are still forgiven. I'm not, not denying that at all. But true, sin, true grace tells us that our sin is a massive deal. It is such a big deal that it costs Jesus everything, that it cost him his life. It is a huge deal that we are sinners and that we have rebelled against God. The Bible says that the heavens shudder, the, the universe literally trembles at the idea that we have rebelled against God. It's a big deal, but... God has come and God has come and, and he has reconciled us to him through Jesus. So it's a big deal. It's such a big deal that it cost Jesus his life. And see, when we understand that, grace, when it's taught correctly, it doesn't remove our incentive to live right. It's the only incentive we can have. That Jesus came and that he died in our place. And see, here's the thing, and this is in your notes. True grace is free. It is offered freely to everyone. There is nothing you can do to earn it and nothing you have to do to earn it. But it's not cheap. It costs Jesus a lot. And when we teach it correctly and we understand it correctly, it's the only incentive we could have to live right. That we were completely separated from God, that we had no hope of getting back, and that Jesus came to us. We didn't come to him. He came to us. He took the initiative. He came and he died in my place to reunite me to him. The Bible says that Christ died for the ungodly. It says, who would even dare to die for a righteous person? But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
This is the only real motivation for good works. This is the only way this is possible, that we are justified by an act, act of God, and then we can go forward and we can walk forward in the good works that he has prepared for us to do. That's the only way that we can, we can truly live right and do good works. And we have got to purge from ourselves, from our mindsets, this cancer of moralism. We've got to purge it from the words we use and from the way we orient our lives, from our thought processes. It's literally strangling the life out of the church today. And there's, there's, because there's two, two uh, um, responses that people have to moralism. Either it results in pride, either it results in this idea, well, I'm good, I prayed the prayer, you know, I stay away from most of the big sins, I'm, I'm all right, I'm, I'm, me and God, are, we're, you know, we're, we're tight, Jesus is my homeboy. We have that pride reaction, or we have a reaction of hopelessness. And pride is what the, the rich young ruler was, was, was dealing with. He had this prideful reaction. I've kept all these commandments since I was a boy. I'm a good guy. I've prayed the prayer. I'm in the club. But many of us struggle with hopelessness. I can never live up to that. How many of us, how many of us have walked into churches before at some point in our life? We see all these perfect people singing their perfect little songs, dressed in their perfect little outfits. I mean, I can never live up to that. I can never be that. How many of us have had this conversation with ourselves? I've had this conversation with myself so many times. That, you know, how can you do that and call yourself a Christian? Look at, look at who you are. Look at what you've done. Look at the things you think when, when nobody's around. Look at the things that you say when you think they're not listening. How can you do that stuff and call yourself a Christian? How can you be the way that you are and call yourself a Christian when the reality is, how can I call myself anything other than a Christian? Who else would have me? Who else would take a sinner like me? What other religion could offer peace with God to a sinner like me, to somebody who's rebelled against God? We're like the disciples when Jesus asked if they were going to leave too, and Peter said, where else will we go? We have nothing left. Who else is there to follow? Of course we're with you. Who else would take us? I can't go to Judaism. I haven't followed the law. I can't go to Islam. I, you know, the, Islam has the scales where your, your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. I know my good deeds don't outweigh my bad deeds. I can't go to Buddhism. It's all about enlightenment and wisdom. And I, Enlightenment and wisdom are two things I don't really feel like I possess a whole lot of. Where else is a sinner like me going to go? Where else are sinners like us going to go? And the answer is to the cross, to grace. It's the only place we can go because for sinners like us, heaven is a complete impossibility. That's what Jesus was saying. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for you to get to heaven on your own. But with what is impossible with you is possible with God. And not only that, it's not just possible with God. We are welcomed in by the grace of God. That heaven that we were shut out of in our own sin welcomes us in by the grace of God. Welcomes us in not because of who we are, but in spite of who we are and because of who Jesus is. We're going to pray together. And I just, Wes, if you guys uh, would come up. And I just want you to know that the altar is open. Communion, we're going to have communion at the front and the back. And I, I don't know if any of you are in this position of the rich young ruler where you've kind of been Jesus is maybe chiseling away at that block of granite in your life today. But uh, if you are, this altar is open. There are, you know, Pastor Tyler, elders in this church, we would love to, to pray with you, to lead you through the scriptures. And I just want to, I'm not going to give like a big altar call and make this like a big moment or anything, but I do want you to know that there are people here that would love to pray with you. There is an altar that is open. Communion is available. We're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us on the cross with the, with the bread and the juice that represents his body and his blood. And I just, uh, just want to encourage you just to seek God this morning, just to press in and, and seek him because we don't have any hope in and of ourselves. But with Jesus, we have nothing but hope. He came, and He died in our place, and He offers us life freely. And it wasn't cheap, it cost Him everything, but He gives it freely. In the book of Revelations, God said, Let all who are thirsty come and receive water without cost. And so that's my offer this morning. That's God's offer this morning. If you're thirsty, come. There's water available and there's no cost. 
cost has already been paid. Let's pray together.